An investigation into sports gambling at Iowa. What exactly is going on? You are locked on Big Ten. Your daily podcast on the Big Ten Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You're tuned into Locked On Big Ten. Everything you need to know about the conference every day. Thanks for making us your first listen every single weekday. I'm your host, Nate Dickinson. And we're joined by Trent Condon of Locked On Hawkeyes as we have some pretty new news in what's going on with Iowa. In the case of potentially some gambling violations of NCAA rules, we'll figure out exactly what it is here with Trent or at least try to start to decipher here in a moment. But first, just the quick numbers. According to the reporting that there, there uh, Iowa has received information about 111 individuals, 26 athletes across five sports, baseball, football, men's basketball, men's track and field and wrestling and one full time employee among them of some sort of potential gambling violations. Gambling is legal in the state of Iowa. You have to be 21 years old to do it. But Aside from that, those numbers are really all that we know from the official reporting, which, as I read through it, Trent, just came off to me as very vague, very not much official talk of what it all is yet. Just Iowa letting us know an investigation is happening. Uh, How do you decipher at least all the information that we've gotten so far? So at this point in time, I, I have been doing quite a bit of work on it, and we have been able to find out that this, more than anything, This is nothing about point shaving. This is not some kind of scandal involving Iowa fixing games. That's not what this is. This, for all intents and purposes, the biggest thing that they're looking and cracking down upon is underage gambling. This is people under the age of 21 betting on sports. And that's why you see the numbers you saw just away from the student athletes that are at the University of Iowa. That is the same thing that is being looked at. Um, Had an Iowa State parent uh, relay a story to me on the Iowa State side of things that Their son was getting ready to take a final and the DCI, the Department of Criminal Investigation, knocked on his doors. He was getting ready to go to his final and confiscated his phone as they had a subpoena for that. So that's what is going on. And more than anything, you mentioned that that parent is of of someone who is nothing to do with athletics or that was in the athletic realm. Yeah. Okay. okay. The athletic realm. And. As they're getting ready to take their final, they had that hanging over their head. So not very fun, I'm going to guess, uh, taking a final with that out there. But that is appears to be what this is about, is cracking down on underage gambling. And because of that, did a little more digging. Well, what does that mean in the state of Iowa? If you gamble under the age of 21, that is a simple misdemeanor. I and mean, we're talking about a slap on the wrist. Here's the problem, though. The NCAA does not view it as a slap on the wrist, and that's where I think if it continues, and we don't find out anything more than that is what this was, then we get a whole much more roads. But what is the NCAA going to think? That is the question, and I'm sure the concern for many Hawkeye fans out there right now, along with their Cyclone brethren. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there is any precedent of like what this would potentially mean here for whoever these students are and all that. Have you looked at all into like what could eventually happen with this? So a year ago, there was a football player from Virginia Tech that self-reported that he had gambled on the NBA. Football player, betting on the NBA in a state that's legal. He was of age. He got a nine-game suspension. It was reduced on appeal to six games. That was one individual player betting on the NBA. We don't know what is out there as it pertains to what these athletes were betting on. Again, it does not appear to be betting on their own teams, but could it be betting on the women's basketball team? There's been a lot of talk about that, betting on them to upset South Carolina in that Final Four game, and and maybe that's where some of these triggers started to happen. There's a lot there uh, as it pertains to that, but when you hear something like half the season, that gets incredibly scary. Iowa baseball is on the precipice of making the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2017. Keaton Anthony, their best player, is one of the four players that sat out the weekend series against Ohio State. Their best offensive guy on the shelf, your two backup catchers, are also amongst the four that weren't there. All of a sudden, it gets a little more difficult for this Iowa baseball team because we need to know now. We need a decision from the NCAA when this investigation is wrapped up. 
what are they going to do? And that's what you don't know. Football, we've got months before football. Same thing with basketball. That's something. But for the track and field athletes, for the baseball athletes that were involved in this, decision needs to come quickly from the NCAA. But it's the NCAA. We know nothing is ever quick when it comes to them. I think that's one of the biggest things to understand in doing this. What you mentioned earlier, uh, that player betting on the NBA. Th this isn't a case, as you said. There's no no indication of any sort of point shaving or doing anything like that but it goes even beyond that it's not even just that you're betting on sports within your school or within your conference or even within collegiate sports if you're betting on the nba even you can get yourself this kind of punishment from the ncaa and i mean i personally don't think it's fair but that's just what the rules are i was thinking about it before it if I was, when I was a student in college, I would have had no idea that this wasn't allowed. Now, if I was in the athletic department in some way, I imagine there would have been some sort of meeting at some point laying out every single one of these rules and what you can and can't do here. But how much of this, aside from potentially the underage stuff, I mean, this seems innocent as far as like what these players or what these people were doing. It, it really does. I mean, that's what it looks like right now. It is... Putting 40 bucks down on the NBA game. You're watching the Warriors Lakers last night. Hey, let's put a little action on it. Maybe, you know, that's what it looks like. And if it is that realm, I think it's going to be high time for the NCAA. Because, first of all, you're kidding yourself if you think your favorite team, that's not I where Iowa State, that your school doesn't have something like this going on. That 18 to 21 year old kids are not gambling on sports. I'll tell you, I went to college was a long time ago. Guess what? Everybody I knew gambled, and that was before it was legal in the state of Iowa. You're kidding itself that this doesn't happen on every college campus and every athletic department in one way or another. So now it's getting to the forefront. And also, yes, until you turn 21, just like drinking, just like a lot of things, you're not allowed to do it. Make that part of the conversation. But does the NCAA also need to realize, yeah, you can't bet on your own sport. You can't bet on your own team. We get all that. But if you're a college basketball player and you want to bet on a baseball game and you're 21 years old, why is that not allowed? It's something that is difficult for me to wrap my mind around. Will it happen quickly? It certainly won't, won't again because we're talking the NCAA. But I think it's something that needs to be at minimum evaluated. When you get to 21, if it's legal in your state, yes, you can bet on sports, just not your own. How do you think this changes? I mean, we're talking about this doesn't seem fair. Uh, I mean, the NCAA is at least for now, still able to levy these punishments. And it doesn't seem like they're going sort of towards any trend of loosening up on whatever hold they still have. I mean, what should be the result of this? I think suspensions still will be warranted. Absolutely. In all of these cases, if it is of that, I've seen a growing sentiment and it's funny how our state's now coming together on the Iowa and Iowa state side of things. You know, they should, I think they've already learned their lesson. It, no, no, no. There needs to be some kind of suspension. There needs to be certainly a message sent. For a, a football player, a football player, I think a game at minimum, maybe two games is something that is likely. You're talking about that. And you're talking about a six of the season. You go that route, five, six games in, for the college basketball side and probably upwards of, of nine to ten for the baseball players. I think that would be something that would make sense because let's be honest, they want to send a message to everybody. They want to have a message and this is going to reverberate across the country and it's going to wake up a lot of people. Hey, gambling is not legal until you're 21. And if that's what it is, there's going to have to be some suspensions that are handed out. Because if this all comes back and there's 41 student athletes that they find and nobody's suspended, it's going to be a bad look, I think, for the state, for the governorship, for DCI. If it all comes to this and the NCAA says, well, no, they're fine. It's all good. I just don't see that being a likely scenario. I think there's a middle ground between nine games for betting on an NBA game and whatever is happening here in Iowa. Uh, again, off the top, we mentioned this has been all pretty generic, pretty vague, just reporting of people acknowledging that investigations are happening. You mentioned it's not going to be a quick thing that happens just because it's the NCAA. But I mean, what timeline do you think is reasonable to be able to get this all sorted out? I would imagine before the start of the next athletic calendar would be at the latest, the deadline. Yeah, I think so. I, I think this is going to move at a pretty quick pace. I mean, these kind of things are not going to be thrown out 
like this and we're going to get to this point of investigation and then it's going to be kept under wraps for weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm going to anticipate that the DCI will have this investigation wrapped up pretty quickly. Details will be handed out and then it'll come to both universities. What do we talk to the NCAA? What is the NCAA enforcement going to be? Right now, we know the four Iowa baseball players are withheld from competition. How long does that continue? Now, we've seen plenty of programs in the past. I, I remember Memphis basketball a couple years back, and they had a player that they said, you know what, we're going to play him anyway. Uh, that didn't turn out very good. I don't see the University of Iowa trying to go at that route, certainly with their baseball program. But I think we're going to have the details from the DCI pretty quickly here, maybe even by the end of the week. And then we start the next steps in the process and talk to the NCAA and what this is going to be. Is suspensions going to be out there? How long are the suspensions? Those are going to be the uh, conversations in the coming days and weeks. Yeah, I think that's going to be the biggest catalyst here is that just this isn't just Iowa and the NCAA. You've got the Iowa Gaming Commission in here. You've got law enforcement involved in potential illegal activity. So whatever's going on, I believe that pushes this thing a little bit faster. Uh, those Iowa baseball guys, is that a Iowa being cautious or is the NCAA telling them to tell them to not play? That was Iowa being cautious. They made that decision okay. right away when the investigation first started, uh, when the players were talked to by the Department of Criminal Investigation. That is where uh, the suspensions were handed down. So the University of Iowa made that decision right away. They also notified the NCAA right away. Maybe that's something that will help out is they let them know very quickly something was afoot. Yeah, it seems like Iowa is getting out ahead of this too, which will hopefully be a good sign that things are minimal, but also a sign that there isn't too much major going on here, that they think that they're going to be able to get through this and be upfront with everything. I mean, I guess as they always should. But uh, yes. Drek Condon here with Locked On Hawkeyes joining us, giving us just a little bit of some insight as to what exactly is going on as this kind of just came out of nowhere uh, here in the latest news from around the Big Ten. And Again, as of right now, it's just a whole bunch of people saying that there is an investigation happening. We don't have names. Once we get them, maybe this becomes bigger news if there's enough big names on that list. But Trent will be here to talk to us if and when that happens, of course. Trent, thank you as always for joining us here off the top of the show to talk with us about what's going on over at the University of Iowa. And of course, if you want to know everything that's going on every day at Iowa, you can tune on into Locked On Hawkeyes, where Trent has the show for you Monday through Friday. We'll talk to you again soon, Trent, I know, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you to Trent Condon for joining us here on the program, and thank you for making Locked On Big Ten your first listen every day. Before we head on to the rest of the program here today, a reminder that you need to make a fast break over to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs. Because right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. You can bet on anything out there. We've got NBA playoffs going on. NHL playoffs are going on. We're going to be talking about some Heisman Trophy odds in a minute. You can bet on those futures over at FanDuel. Player props, anything of the sort that you want to bet on, you can do it at FanDuel.com. And if you head to FanDuel.com slash locked on, you can get that no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than the America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Let's continue on with the program and talk some more Big Ten football. And I want to discuss the star potential of the Big Ten this season. Because we had a lot of stars last season in the conference. C.J. Stroud out there, J.J. McCarthy making a name for himself. Blake Corum making a name for himself with the Wolverines as well. Chase Brown over at Illinois. All sorts of people that were some of the biggest names in all of college football. But in this upcoming season, it's a little less clear who's going to be taking over the throne at the top of the top of the Big Ten in star power. Because at least right now, the bar is being set pretty high as to what you have to do to be the best player in the Big Ten. And I think that may be taking a step back here in this season. I'll tell you what I mean. As far as just the numbers go, in four of the last five seasons, the Big Ten has had at least one player represented at the Heisman Trophy finalist and award presentation. At least one in four out of the five last seasons. And... While that may not seem like something that's too out of the ordinary, the Big Ten is always producing some of the best players in college football. Up before that stretch of five years leading up to here today, 
We hadn't had another Big Ten player in that room since Melvin Gordon in 2014. Before that, it was when Troy Smith won the award with Ohio State in 2006. So the question becomes, who takes over that spot as, if not a Heisman finalist, the biggest star in the Big Ten? Because we've had some, if you ask me, pretty obvious choices over this four out of five year stretch. Three out of four players were just the Ohio State quarterback, which it is what it is. The other one being Aiden Hutchinson last season with Michigan. But at least right now, I'm not seeing any sort of clear-cut advantage to give to anybody as to who would be the favorite to be at that ceremony come the end of next season. Going into this season, it was pretty obvious that Bryce Young, or C.J. Stroud, was going to have that kind of a potential to make that award ceremony again. And it's hard to predict this stuff, too. But just as I look up and down, I'm not really seeing any candidates that I'm looking at and saying, oh, that guy is primed to make it to that final three. So, who is it, though, who has the best chance to be able to be a star in the Big Ten? Or will this be a year where just the Big Ten has great players, but not the best of the best as far as one individual? I think that may be the way we're going, but let's talk names here. As I mentioned, four out of the last five seasons, the Big Ten have had at least one player at that award ceremony. And in three of the four years, it was the Ohio State quarterback. And as such, Kyle McCord, one of the potential starting quarterbacks for Ohio State this fall, is the player with the best odds to win the Heisman Trophy right now over at FanDuel.com. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, get that no sweat first bet. His odds are at plus 2,000 though. And there are a whole lot of other people between him and the top of that list too. Of course, Caleb Williams, the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, leading the way there. So really, really long odds, even for the best player in the Big Ten to be able to get that Heisman Trophy, is really just telling me more of what I believe, which is that the Big Ten may just not have that kind of superstar, superstar standout as an individual this season. Because even at the top of the best Big Ten teams, there's going to be spreading of the love as far as the stats and how they roll out. Uh, For instance, you have... J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy at the moment is the third highest odds in the Big Ten to win the Heisman Trophy at plus 3,000. He's probably going to have a good season, but at the same time, Michigan is probably not going to pass the ball as much as you would need to for J.J. McCarthy to be considered for that award. They've got Blake Corum back. They've got Donovan Edwards back. Speaking of which, Blake Corum, another name on this list, is at plus 3,000. He's going to be splitting carries with Donovan Edwards, even If, of course, he dominates, that is. Another name, Marvin Harrison Jr. He's somebody who's going to have a great season this year again. But he's still got a Mecca Ibuka right there to split receiving yards with him, too. So when I look at the best players and I think, oh, maybe this guy can break out. Maybe this guy can do this and that. Even if they have the great seasons, they still have to get over that obstacle of the fact that they're not the only ones touching the football here. And, of course, that's the case with most players who win this Heisman Trophy. I mean, it's not like the guys who are winning from Georgia and Alabama are just playing in lopsided rosters where they're dominating everybody. But there's specific cases here with these Big Ten top candidates where you have guys who are going to, you know, get stats taken away from them in a way that maybe some of the other top candidates to win this trophy won't. The quarterbacks are, of course, the biggest prospects and potential to win this award. And you have, again, McCord at plus 2,000, McCarthy at plus 3,000. But then right in the middle is the new guy, Drew Aller at Penn State. He is, if you ask me, I'm hesitant because I don't know what's going to happen at Ohio State, but if you ask me, I believe he could have the best chance of anyone to make this final three, just because he, at least I believe, is going to be given the reins here at Penn State rather fully here. Now, Penn State's going to have a plenty good rushing attack coming back next season as well, too. And Penn State's going to want to run the ball, I know. But I just feel a different kind of desire, I think, with the Nittany Lions to be able to use Drew Aller than, uh, say, Jay Jay McCarthy has at Michigan. Michigan, you know what we're getting with J.J. McCarthy. He's got that big playability. But Michigan's going to be a team that runs the football. If he can have some sort of breakout season, obviously, he can explode. Uh, Same thing with Kyle McCord. If he wins the starting job, he can explode. Drew Aller can explode. But as far as which one I see more likely to do that, there's no favorite in my mind. I think all three of those guys have the potential, but all three of them also have these long odds because we don't know what they're going to do here. Which is why, if you ask me, 
I think there's a good chance that one of the non-quarterbacks is the player who makes it to this ceremony. In particular, Marvin Harrison Jr. Look at the situation here. Yes, he does have Ibuka over there on the other side too, but even with that, caught more than 1,200 yards last season. Didn't have to deal with Jackson Smith and Jigba the whole season too, so he was one of the top guys. But this season, I believe he will take over as the top guy in that receiving core. He will also have the name recognition, of course, Marvin Harrison Jr., that people are going to have an eye on him. And he's going to be working with a first-year quarterback. A first-year quarterback that right now isn't, at the very least, convincing anyone that he has this job firmly. So there's still very much a competition going on here. That tells me that whoever's there is going to be eased into things, maybe, is whatever the Ohio State version of that is. He'll be eased into airing it out every single game, which I'm sure will still mean plenty of passing. But whoever that new quarterback is is going to rely on Marvin Harrison Jr. Maybe lean on Marvin Harrison Jr. When it's that 50-50 ball that he's going to have to throw deep and rely on somebody to make that catch, that's Marvin Harrison Jr. right there. That's what he is going to do. So when I think about the breakout potential and the potential to stuff the stat sheets, I'm looking at a guy like him because of the situation in which the guy throwing him the ball is going to be throwing him the ball a whole, whole lot. Blake Corm could be another one. But again, he's splitting those carries with Donovan Edwards, but he is somebody who is going to get his numbers, we know. It's just also a lot harder for running backs to be able to get onto that stage. Speaking of which, there's plenty of good defensive players in the Big Ten as well, too. But I don't have them here, and they won't be listed on the odds for the Heisman Trophy just because it's really, really hard to do that. You need to be more than just the best and really, really good to be able to make it into the top three of Heisman voting as a defender. You also have to be just a little bit lucky in the way that you're able to make impact plays that people remember. That's what Aiden Hutchinson did. That's why he was able to make it to that finals. Because, one, he beat Ohio State, but also he was doing it with dazzling plays along the way, too, right? Before Hutchinson, the last guy who was at the finals for the Heisman was Manti Teo with Notre Dame in 2012. So a decade of a break between even nominations to the finals has me thinking that while the Big Ten's maybe best players might be on the defensive side of the football, they just don't make it to the Heisman finals. That's just not the way it works. So if we're talking star power here, I think the biggest takeaway you have to have is that there are plenty of candidates to become the next Big Ten superstar this season. And the job is, without a doubt, open. So somebody will have to take that spot. Somebody will be the best player in the Big Ten this season. The question is, does the conference prestige now give the Big Ten the ability to, kind of the way the SEC has always, at least always have somebody in the Heisman conversation? Because that hasn't always been the case here. Again, as of late, Ohio State quarterbacks and Aiden Hutchinson have been pulling the load for the Big Ten as far as Heisman representation at the final ceremony. But it, at least right now, I think the big question from a conference standpoint is, has this conference become respectable enough over the last few years and the way that it's been able to compete with the SEC on the football field to be able to convince voters for the Heisman Trophy that one of these guys is the best of the best or one of the best three even? I don't know if that's the case, and I don't know if anyone in the Big Ten will put up the stats to make it there, even if people are open to it, because it's still just right now a whole lot of questions about how everything's going to get split up with a whole lot of new people and new faces around the Big Ten. It's a big question, it's a big question to ask right now, more than anything, because we're months away from even starting the season, nevertheless getting to the end of it in the Heisman Trophy ceremony. But at least the way I see it at the moment, we're looking at a Big Ten football season where there's going to be plenty of star power, uh, but maybe not that necessarily national recognition that comes with making it to the finals of the Heisman Trophy nominations. That's just my thoughts on it. We'll talk more about it, of course, as the season continues on, off-season continues on, and season starts. But right now, we're going to wrap things up here on Locked On Big Ten, get you some of the news from around the Big Ten to finish up. But first... Big recruiting, recruiting news on the basketball court this week. Bronny James does not commit 
to Ohio State, instead choosing USC and the Trojans. And just real quickly before we wrap things up, I want to make it very clear that while Ohio State doesn't get the guy, I feel like we were a little bit hopeful in thinking that he could. It's a situation where, yes, Bronny James has the Ohio State ties, of course. He got the Ohio State visit, which I guess in my head was probably the biggest thing pushing me toward, oh, maybe you could actually go to Ohio State. But the point is that, at least right now, you have a situation where there's a guy in California who has been growing up in California for most of his life. And while, yes, he is LeBron James' son, and LeBron James loves Cleveland and Ohio State's his favorite school, Bronny James didn't spend all that much of his life there, right? He's gone to high school on the West Coast. He's been at Sierra Canyon. USC is that local school for him. That's one of three reasons why really this didn't really make any sense. Number two being the NIL money was going to be different. Bronny James is Bronny James. He was going to get his money no matter what. But, I mean, do you really need me to compare L.A. to Columbus, Ohio? He was going to make more money there always. And, again, he's closer to home for him. So we know he already has those connections there. And the connections are also there on the basketball court, too. Number one overall recruit in this class, Isaiah Collier, plays with LeBron on the West Coast, knows him, or plays with Bronny on the West Coast, knows him, and is somebody, again, that while he's at USC, he's going to know a lot more people there. So while Ohio State was always going to be on the table because of the LeBron James effect, I think the idea that Ohio State was ever actually going to get him may have been a little bit far-fetched. Yes, the visit is one thing, and that is one way to get your hopes up, but it was said at the time that even LeBron James was saying, I wanted him to have that official college recruiting experience and be able to go on those visits. And that may have been more than anything else why he took it. Because now that it's over, I think it's become pretty obvious that uh, it was kind of a no-brainer that he was going to end up somewhere on the West Coast. And UCLA did not make an offer. Let's move on to other Big Ten news before we wrap up the show. In Big Ten women's lacrosse news, the official yearly awards have been announced. Uh, attacker of the year is Northwestern's Izzy Skane. Northwestern also gets representation for Rookie of the Year in Madison Taylor. And the Coach of the Year is Kelly Amante Hiller as Northwestern wins the Women's Lacrosse Championship. Midfielder of the Year is Mary Shailen Ahern. And goaltender of, or, uh, Midfielder of the Year is Maryland's Shailen Ahern. And Goaltender of the Year is Maryland's Emily Sterling. Finally, Defender of the Year is Madison Ball, also from Maryland. We'll get into more here next time on Locked On Big Ten. I'm your host, Nate Dickinson. Be sure to follow us along on wherever you get your podcasts, YouTube and Twitter, too. It's at Locked On Big Ten with a one zero at the end when you're typing it out, not T-E-N. I'm Nate Dickinson at Nate with Sports on Twitter. We'll talk to you next time here on Locked On Big Ten.